I've seen a lot of change, been through a lot of pain. Some things are not the same as they were a year ago. But all will be okay. I move on each and every day. The past is where it stays. Way back a year ago. My chat with Chris Murphy back in May 2005. Burnaby, BC, Canada. Jerry, Chris, could you tell me how it happened that you became involved in the subject of Sasquatch? Chris. In 1993, my son, Daniel, was taking an anthropology course at Capilano College. All class members were required to do a presentation, assignment of some sort, and he decided to do a talk on the Sasquatch, just why he selected this subject, I never asked. He got approval to do the talk and proceeded to put it together. As I had a photocopier, he asked me to make overhead transparencies for him. He found René Dayenden's book at the library, Sasquatch slash Bigfoot, by Don Hunter with René Dayenden, and noted René's invitation on page 200 for information on the Sasquatch. As René lived in Richmond, very close to Vancouver, then telephoned him and asked if he would help with the college project. René said he would be pleased to assist, so Dan made an appointment to visit him. As Dan did not have a car, he asked me to take him to René's place. This I did, and just sort of sat and listened as Dan asked René questions. René was very obliging and helpful, he explained the history of the creature and showed us photos and casts. He even gave Dan some photos and a cast from the Patterson slash Gimlin film site. The session lasted for about two hours and arrangements were made to get together again in a few days. I assisted Dan with his presentation, write-up and so forth, and then took him back to see René as arranged. By this time, I had started to get interested in the subject it was all completely new to me, although I had certainly heard of the Sasquatch and recalled seeing the Patterson slash Gimlin film. I also recalled seeing an article in 1982 showing Rant Mullins with a pair of wooden feet, and at that time sort of wrote off the whole issue as a hoax. I had absolutely no idea as to the extent of the phenomenon. René was very informative, entertaining, humorous, and a lot of fun. He went out of his way to assist Dan, and we all got along very well. After the college project was completed, we continued to visit René. I was considering retirement from work, B.C. Tell, and was sort of seeking new interests. I offered to work with René in marketing some of his material, posters made from film frames and casts. He agreed, and the more I got involved, the more I learned. After I retired in September 1994, I dedicated a lot of time to the subject and it gradually grew to a passion. Jerry, while it may seem to be a natural progression for a writer to want to write about his passion, wasn't your first involvement with Sasquatch literature, the republication of Roger Patterson's book? Chris, Roger Patterson's book, Do Abominable Snowmen of America Really Exist, was my first major involvement with Sasquatch literature. Actually, I did not know that Roger had written a book until 1995. As I recall, in that year I found it referenced somewhere and asked René if he had a copy that I could borrow. René provided a copy and told me that he owned the copyright. After reading the book, I returned it and suggested that we reprint it and market it along with the other items we were offering. By this time, the internet was in full swing and I either had a website or was working on one. René was not that big on the idea and suggested that I see if Glenn Coling, who had the original book printed, had any copies we could buy. Coling said he had only a few, somewhere, so that really left no choice but to reprint if we wanted to offer the book. On my next visit with René, I again suggested we reprint, and this time he agreed. I reprinted 300 books, that's all. René was quite impressed with the book and this led to the reprinting of Fred Beck's booklet, I Fought the Apeman of M.T. St. Helens. Here, again, I had no idea the booklet existed. I went to see René one afternoon and he simply handed me the booklet and said, here, you can do this one also, I've checked with Ronald Beck and he said it was okay. Both books were offered for about two years or so. They were all sold during that time. Gary, Bigfoot in Ohio, Encounters with the Grassman would have been your first collaboration book on the subject. How did this come into being and is it still in print? Chris, Ohio more or less came to the forefront with me upon release of photographs of a possible nest structure found in Summit County by Jody Cook, George Clapison, and Terry Endres in February 1995. As I recall, I contacted Jody for more information, and in the course of providing such, he informed me of an unusual telephone call he had received from a U.S. 
army colonel about such structures. Whether this person was who he claimed to be was not verified, however, the story he provided was in my mind very unique, all about a U.S. Army cover-up related to Bigfoot. There was also a little mystery associated with the nest photo that Jody brought to my attention, unusual formations in the photo background. My son, Dan, was working with me at that time and we decided to do an article about the nest and the colonel's story, Dan's article, I assisted. The story got front cover prominence in the 1996 summer issue of Unsolved UFO Sightings and Other Unexplained Mysteries. While I don't give much credibility to such stories, there continues to be information surfacing along the same lines. Some time later in 1995, Jody sent me a booklet he had prepared on Ohio Bigfoot incidents, asking if I would look at it for possible publication. While it was not suitable as is, I saw that the information provided had potential for a proper book. I thereupon started working with Jody and George to this end. In 1996, Jody came out to Vancouver for a Sasquatch symposium and stayed with me for a few days. I got to know him quite well during this time. I published the book in 1997, only about 200 or so copies. Barnes and Noble accepted it for their stores, but their deal was far too rigid. All of the books printed were sold and I did not do another run as I had hardly covered my costs. Over the years, Jody and I have kept in touch. About one year ago, we decided to update the work and seek a publisher. He sent me a lot of update information and in the course of time I completely revised the book. Now working with Hancock House Publishers, I offered the book to this company for proper publication. The proposal was accepted, and the book will be released under the title, Bigfoot Encounters in Ohio, Quest for the Grassman, in the fall of this year, 2005. Jerry, there was a stir within the Sasquatch community with a story that was released, about yourself and Cliff Crook, and certain conclusions which came about after you both had spent some time studying the P-G film. What was that all about? Chris, this story actually goes back to day one, when my son, Dan, asked me to help him with his college presentation. He asked me to provide transparencies of the printed patterson slash gimlin film frames that are shown in the book Man Like Monsters on Trial, UBC 1980, plate 16 to 20. One of the prints, plate number 18, is the famous frame 352 I provided the transparencies and then, because I was intrigued with the prints, I took a 35mm photo of each. I have all of the proper photographic equipment, lenses, copy stand, lights, which I used mainly for my stamp collecting hobby at that time. The photographs came out very clearly, much clearer than the actual book prints. I now understand, I believe, that when the images were reduced to fit onto a regular 4 inch by 6 inch photograph, the camera tightened up the pixels to the point where they could not be seen, even with a magnifying glass. I took one of the 35mm prints, that of frame 352, to a local copy house and asked for an 8.5, x11, enlargement of it. The owner informed that he had just installed a new Minolta laser color printer, and also that he now had the new gloss paper for printouts. I had a copy made with this printer using the gloss paper. The resulting print was amazing, I could see quite clearly the nipple on the creature's right breast. Keep in mind that at this time, 1993, I had no idea what work had or had not been done on the film frames. As a matter of fact, I assumed that the film would have been subjected to detailed analysis long before now and certainly I was not looking at anything new. The Minolta laser copy was filed away and I simply forgot about it. Time went by and I started working with René de Inden in making posters from the film frames. René provided me with the Sibichromes, very clear photographs, for this purpose. I had to do a lot of experimenting to get the posters just right, color, sizing, and so forth. I had a local reprographics shop do this for me. We would experiment with different settings and I always kept all of the experimental prints. These I placed in my junk file, which in time got very large. In 1995 during one of my conversations with René, he imparted that Dr. Grover Krantz said one cannot see a nipple on the creature's right breast. I said that such was strange because I had been able to see it on one of my prints. By this time, I had totally forgotten about he Minolta print, but still had a clear picture in my mind of this detail. When I got home, I started going through the raft of prints in the junk file. The very last print was the Minolta print, but I thought it was simply just one of the experimental prints for posters. In other words, I thought that it was a print taken from a Sibichrome. To prove the point that the nipple could be seen, I took several 35mm detail photos off the Minolta print. Now. 
The same thing happened here as with the book photo, the camera made the resulting prints appear like an actual photograph, pixels cannot be seen. I showed Renee the 35mm prints and proved my point that the nipple was visible. When I got home, I sort of dropped the photos on my desk, and one of them landed upside down. In the morning, I noticed that a curious bell-shaped detail was seen in the creature's midsection when the photo was viewed in this way. I showed Renee the anomaly and we agreed it was just photographic noise. Nevertheless, I did send the photos to Henry Frenzoni who was involved in a detailed analysis of the film. It was Henry, in fact, who dubbed the artifact the bell. I suggest that close attention should be paid to this area on the creature to ensure that there was no substance to what appeared in the photos. Naturally, I thought the detail would be visible on the actual Sibichrome of frame 352, but upon examination I could not see it. This confirmed to me that the detail was probably just noise so I dropped the whole matter. When I later discovered that the photographs were taken from the Minolta print, I was further convinced of this. During this time, I learned that very little had been done on the film as to detailed analysis of the film frames. I therefore made close-up 35mm photographs of various parts of the creature directly from the Sibichromes, I did not have a scanner at this time. Remarkably, a detail from frame 323 showed what appeared to me to be the same detail I had seen on frame 352. However, the detail was rotated, more or less upside down as to that seen on frame 352, also, a trace of the detail could be seen on frame 339 and 350. Now I was in a bit of a state, how could the same noise appear on different film frames? It was now September 1998. The Naysai report was out, and Rene and I had parted company. I decided to put together a report on all my findings, there were a number of other curious things as well as the bell, and send it to prominent researchers, Cliff Crook was among these. Over the past year or so, Cliff had sent me a lot of material related to the Patterson slash Gimlin film, court papers and so forth. I knew Cliff was of the opinion that the film was a hoax and at the time, I definitely had misgivings about some aspects of the film and its circumstances, most of which have now been cleared. Response to my report was mixed. Those who replied, other than Cliff Crook, were noncommittal. Cliff gave the evidence full credibility. In other words, he was convinced that the detail probably existed and could be a man-made item. I agreed, and indeed thought right from the start that this was a possible. We both set about to see if anything could be found to match the item, fastening device of some sort. After about two months of searching, nothing was found. In November 1998 Cliff asked my permission to go public with the finding. I said that such would be his call. I envisioned an article in a local, Bothell, WA, paper, and in some ways thought that if a lot of people saw an image of the detail, something might come to light. An article was published in the News Tribune on November 29 showing Cliff's clay model of the detail. The information went to the wire services and ended up in, I am told, some 148 major newspapers worldwide. There was, of course, serious repercussions from the Bigfoot fraternity. I thereupon sent all of my photographs to Dr. Henner Farenbach for analysis. He concluded right from the start that details of the size of the bell would not be visible in the film frames and what can be seen is simply photographic noise. I argued that the same noise appears to me to be visible on several frames. I will mention here that I did finally find traces of the detail on the actual sibichrome of frame 352. My final conclusion on the whole matter is that the detail probably exists, but it is just something caught in the creature's hair or fur and it sort of rotated when the creature moved. That the detail manifested itself into an odd bell-shaped form is just a printing-slash-photographic anomaly. I do not provide my detail photographs on this whole issue for websites because they will get misinterpreted and the whole thing will break open again. Being a Bigfoot buff, I certainly could have buried the whole thing right from the start, why call attention to possible negative material on the film? Why give the skeptics more to chew on? However, keep in mind that hiding information is wrong. If we are going to resolve the Sasquatch slash Bigfoot issue, then we need to put everything on the table. My mistake was in not getting a professional analysis of the finding before allowing it to be released. Jerry, with all of the controversy surrounding the P slash G film, has any valuable information come out of it to enlighten and bolster Sasquatch research? Or is it a bump in the linear study of the Sasquatch, which stands on its own? A singular curiosity or a detrimental shrine which has been given way too much value. 
Chris, in a nutshell, the Patterson slash Gimlin film is a paradox, an argument that apparently derives self contradictory conclusions by valid deduction from acceptable premises. C. There can be no argument that the film exists, and that it does depict a physical primate of some sort. Now, to claim that the primate scene is not an ordinary human being, contradicts established scientific findings. There are no other primates native to North American other than human beings, i.e., none that have been proven beyond a doubt to exist. To claim that the primate seen is a human being, man in a costume, contradicts what can be seen in the film, i.e., detailed scientific examination indicates that it is a natural being. Both sides of the argument now get heaped with tons of circumstantial evidence which amounts to absolutely nothing. The non-human group, Bigfooters, point to thousands of Bigfoot sightings, footprints, and a raft of other evidence. While this does increase the likelihood that the filmed creature is non-human, it does not prove anything. The human group points to testimony, what people have said, and the fact that there is no conclusive hard evidence for such creatures. While this might satisfy some people on the issue, again it does not prove anything. The only way the film can be either positively authenticated or debunked is by finding evidence supporting either stand within the film itself. To do this, one needs to look at details that are far beyond the film resolution. Looking for hoax indicators is futile because even if they were there, they would not be visible, both because they would probably be hidden in the first place, and because they would be too small to see. The only exception here would be a long seam or row of zipper teeth, but even finding something that might appear to be such would be highly inconclusive. So, we have a stalemate, one can't point to the lack of hoax indicators as proof the creature is real, nor can one find such indicators to prove it is a hoax. The evidence we have that indicates the creature is a natural being, in my opinion, outweighs evidence to the contrary. Here, I am referring to the conclusions reached by the North American Science Institute and the Russian hominologists, Igor Burtsev and Dmitry Bayanov. Nevertheless, there is absolutely no way one could prove authenticity beyond a reasonable doubt. One can't get DNA from a strip of 16mm film. Here I might add that if someone were to come up with a moth-eaten costume that appeared to match the filmed creature, how can it be proven it is the same costume? Even if the Sasquatch is never found, the possibility that one of its kind did exist and was filmed walking along a sandbar at Bluff Creek, California in October 1967 will remain. Jerry, because of the internet, is there too much information washing over us now and how do we interpret such? Instead of studying evidence one has to spend, more and more, time deciding if something is evidence before it can labeled and filed it away. Should we worry? Is all information important information? Or must every little snippet of information be filtered carefully, as to its worth, before being presented before skeptics? Or can we relax and allow the cream of good information to still rise to the top pretty much on its own merits? Does our community require watchdogs and self-policing? Chris, the internet certainly brought about more reported incidents. There were probably just as many before, but we did not hear of them. Prior to the internet, if one had a sighting, he or she did not have many choices for making the information known. The media took some, some appeared in letters to major researchers, De Inden had a big box full, and the rest went nowhere. Now, one has a choice of numerous websites. By the same token, there is likely more fabricated incident reports as a result of the internet. However, I don't believe such are significant in number because there is nothing to gain. It is interesting to note that when computers were introduced into the general business world, we found out just how inefficient we had been. The same can be said for the internet as it applies to Sasquatch sightings. Nevertheless, we must keep in mind that as the people population grows, and more and more people go into wilderness areas, then more sightings will result. This is not an indication of more Sasquatch, just more eyes to see them. Whatever the case, that there are now too many reports to deal with is very true. Here, however, we need to come to grips with the advantage of dealing with reports. Sending someone out to talk with the witness seldom results in getting any more information than what we already have. Verifying the report does not get us any closer to resolving the issue. Really, the only reports we should be looking at are those that include a photograph slash video, hard evidence, scat or hair, or the likelihood that the creature is still in the area. I am not saying that reports are useless, they do provide statistics and ongoing encouragement. I think the point needs to be made that sighting investigations are a reactive process. Really, what we are doing is waiting around for some individual, tourist, truck driver, camper, and so forth, to have a sighting. We then hope that the individual will report the incident, 
and if he or she does, we hope to be able to come up with some hard evidence related to the incident, footprints, hair, feces. We even hope that the creature might still be around. This is a lot of hoping. If you think about it, there are very few people actually looking for the creature, and one cannot really expect to find something if he does not look for it. We need to get proactive and go out specifically and look for the creature, like Patterson and Gimlin. Where should we look? The obvious answer here is, where there have been the most recorded sightings, but I am not of that opinion. I believe Northern Canada is the best bet, specifically British Columbia. The only reason there have not been a lot of sightings up there is because there are so few people. The same situation here applies to all animals. If one wishes to photograph and study a wild animal, then the best thing to do is to go to the place where the animal normally resides. Certainly, one can hang around in local parks and hope that the animal of choice shows up, which it certainly might do, but chances are very slim. A case in point here is that of a wolverine that wandered down into Port Moody. It was injured, I believe by a car, and great care was taken to restore it back to health, it was even given a root canal, and return it to the wilderness. In many ways, we are waiting for the same thing to occur with a Sasquatch. Jerry, it is all about the gathering and sharing of information which nurtures and empowers the Sasquatch community and which informs the public in general. You were the architect of one such gathering of information in the summer of 2004 at the Vancouver Museum. How did this come about and what was involved to make it work? Chris, in 2001, I reasoned that one way to get possible high-profile scientific attention to the Sasquatch-slash-Bigfoot issue would be to prepare a presentation showing the best evidence we have and provide it on a CD to major universities and institutions. This idea was an outcropping to Peter Byrne's idea to do basically the same thing with a detailed analysis of the Patterson-slash-Gimlin film. Here, the idea was to do a scientific analysis, and if positive, film indicates a natural creature, provide a printed report to such institutions. Unfortunately, while the report was positive, the distribution never took place. While a CD would not be as impressive as a printed report, it was far more cost-effective. I thereupon started to prepare a presentation using what information I had or could find. As I moved forward, it became evident that what I was doing would make a wonderful book on the subject. My main concern in this connection was getting the rights to use all of the material I had selected. A friend in Quebec, Yvonne Leclerc, agreed to assist me with the project by providing his material and preparing illustrations. I had known Yvonne for some years and had shared information with him. It was Yvonne who came up with the title Meet the Sasquatch, originally Meet Bigfoot, for the presentation, and perhaps one day a book. By January 2003, I had a very impressive presentation. In that month, my daughter, Donna, urged me to see an exhibit at the Vancouver Museum on the 50s, this being my time, as it were. After going through the exhibit, I noticed that the museum did not have anything on the Sasquatch. This was particularly odd in that British Columbia is well noted for the creature. I determined that if they would make room for a few items, casts and posters particularly, I would donate such material. I envisioned a cabinet in the corner sort of thing. I was not aware that this museum and the provincial museum in Victoria did have Sasquatch-related artifacts in storage. I wrote a letter to the museum showing printed scans of the material I had and suggested a display. I also provided a copy of the CD showing the presentation. The museum replied and said they would like me to provide a full exhibit on the subject that would run for six months or so. I contacted John Green who agreed to work with me on the project. I subsequently contacted other researchers for donations, Rick Knoll, Dr. Farnbach, Dr. Bindernagel, Dr. Meldrum to name a few. The museum informed that I would need a catalogue of exhibited items. I made a color printout of the presentation and started working towards preparing a catalogue. In conjunction with the catalogue, I went to see Dave Hancock, Hancock House Publishers. I showed him the presentation printout and he suggested that rather than a catalogue, have a book to accompany the exhibit, which would be far more appropriate for this kind of exhibit. He advised that the presentation would be excellent for such a book. The museum agreed to this plan and provided assistance and full cooperation in preparing the book and getting approvals for use of images and artifacts. All items on exhibit were referenced to a book page number. I was appointed a co-curator for the museum with authority to loan material on behalf of the museum. I then asked Tom Steenberg to edit the book on an ongoing basis. A lot of material was added to the exhibit and the book as we moved forward, making coordination quite a challenge. While the whole project was certainly worthwhile, 
and something was definitely accomplished by getting an exhibit on the Sasquatch into a major city museum, there is something that needs to be said. That exhibit ran from June 14, 2004 to February 1, 2004, about 26 weeks. I, of course, had a pass, so could visit and see any and all exhibits at any time I pleased. I visited the museum at least once a week, usually on Sunday, although often during the week as well as on Sunday. I generally walked through all exhibits on my visits. Seldom were there many people in the museum, not just my exhibit, all exhibits. At the most no more than four or five people at any one time. I think that if the reader asks himself or herself when the last time he or she went to a museum, the question as to why the museum was virtually empty will be answered. Museums are a thing of the past. The main, and almost only, patrons are school children who are required to attend on class visits. I can only speak for the Vancouver Museum, but I would suspect that what I say is the same for all museums. The media, I believe, is aware of this so don't pay much attention to museums. Unfortunately, the exposure for the Sasquatch issue I had hoped to get through a museum exhibit was highly marginal, if anything. The saving grace was my book, with due credit to John and Tom, Meet the Sasquatch, which basically resulted from the exhibit as I have explained. One other minor accomplishment, I did manage to get a number of Sasquatch artifacts out of museum mothballs for a few months. Sadly, they have now all be returned to their respective dungeons. Jerry, what can you reveal to us about your newest project? Chris, from what I know of it, this endeavor will make, meet the Sasquatch, appear to be no more than a footnote, despite its lavish beauty. Chris. Meet the Sasquatch is primarily a book about the hard, or reasonably hard, evidence support the existence of Sasquatch. The only sightings it references, other than the P-G film, are in the early written records and what I call the classics. Sightings really don't carry much weight unless they are backed by a photograph or tangible evidence of some sort, footprints, handprints, hair and so forth. I naturally did not plan to include sightings to any great degree in the original presentation that formed the basis of the book. The reason I included the sighting material shown was to generally set the stage, as it were. What I included were the most colorful and most publicized Sasquatch stories. In retrospect, I should have included only the most credible stories four of what I show are among this group, Burns, Ruby Creek, Roe, and Crew. Most of the other material is highly controversial, especially Jacko. The Sasquatch Chronicle, my current project, is a totally different work. It complements Meet the Sasquatch by concentrating on sightings. With both books, a fairly comprehensive account of the Sasquatch is provided. This is basically a no-holds-barred book. If a sighting received attention in the media or attention with an author, such as a candidate for inclusion. I am not evaluating material, although sometimes I include a personal comment. The book is being written under the chronicle format whereby every story is presented in the current tense, although it just happened. In other words, the reader is automatically put into the story time frame, he or she is not transported back with past date references. Where subsequent events have occurred related to the same story, I include a fast-forward section to bring the reader up to date. The book will be a highly illustrated work with as many photographs and illustrations as possible. From the outset, it needs to be understood that this book is about what people have said occurred. I have no way of disproving their stories and I really can't play judge and jury. I must let readers decide for themselves as to the merits of the material presented. People have all sorts of different belief systems. What might be highly credible to one person is totally without credibility to another. Nevertheless, I draw the line at the tabloids and what I consider pure nonsense. This segment ends here. To be continued another day. Many thanks to Chris Murphy for sharing his time. And inviting me to his home. Okay, dear listener, that about wraps it up for now. My name is Jerry Matthews. You can reach me at yellowcoyote at talus.net. Thank you for your interest, and until the next time, keep searching. <laughs>